So welcome back to the DHE show, everybody. Our intro sucks ass. I don't care. We're going to jump right in. We'll get an intro when we actually are ready. At this altitude, I can run flat out for blah, 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 blah. Okay, cool. All right, that's our intro. Next. Trying to be Tim Ferriss? At this Um, altitude. Um, We were talking about TikTok. Are you a fan of TikTok in general? I mean, I I don't hate it. It's, It's interesting. The, the thing with TikTok, right? Like I post on Instagram and I either get Chinese bots or I get, um, you just get a bunch of crap, right? Whereas on, on TikTok, it's interesting because I, when I post, it just, I get like, it goes out to everybody and all of a sudden you got all these weird comments. <laughs> I think it's something that I, I still struggle with. Like I've never been a social media guy. I've been on social media, absolutely, but I've never been a prolific poster. The amount of just like weird and stupid and, obscene comments that you get from people you're like w- like what kind of crack are you smoking bro or like <laughs> like just you know what i mean like and and, and my favorite part is like I, my real name is on there so like you can look me up yeah but these people don't use their real names it's like you're just this little bitch hiding behind a fucking computer screen you're gonna sound super tough like dude yeah you want you want to fucking talk let's go buddy Let's go have a conversation. That's the pro. There is no conversation. It's just prodding the bear. It's it, it, and and that's the thing. Like we we've taken a pretty fun stance. I told Abby this a while back. Like, do people gonna be assholes? Like we'll be assholes right back. It was like it was like that lady I told you about. Like I fucking thought it was great. Her Instagram, where she the person like she's like it's not it's not a it's not a it's not a chemical like the chemicals in the food is not the issue. Like this stuff like there's no science to show this stuff is bad. And someone's like, well, if you can't pronounce it, then it's bad. And, the, and like. But he's like, there's a hundred some compounds in a banana that make up a banana and you probably can't pronounce them. And the lady's like, the lady made a comment about something else. She's like, then learn how to fucking read. And I was like, <laughs> it's such a great response. Like it's not, it's not a me problem. It's a you problem. Learn how to read. Like, and I, I don't know. So that's a rabbit hole. Like I, I, I think TikTok's great. I think that there's a lot of absolutely weird, crazy people that, you know, are living in a, you know, very shitty place drinking their Budweiser and they're just going to their mission today is to make someone else feel like shit and they're not going to stop until they accomplish it. Yeah, but I think it's all it, social media. And we're not here to talk social media. It's just we were it's been very interesting to see. We're trying to get into TikTok as a company and uh, it ever makes it sound so easy. Oh, you just push it. Uh, yeah, it doesn't quite work that way. You, you don't just push it. Yeah, right. No, that was interesting this morning. Actually, I think I was on LinkedIn. I saw someone and that was that was the title of their thing. It's like it's like posting daily isn't a strategy. Yeah, like you need to have content. You need to have an idea of what you're doing, and I think that is inherently the most difficult thing with social media. Matt is the fact that you have to, and it's tough, right? We we we've said this a million times. We go back and forth. Now we're on a pretty similar page. We know where we're going, um, but it, it, it is brutal. Yeah. The other thing I. Are we going to talk all about social media? Because this is the piece no. of... Do, do, no, no, no. I wanted to talk about funding, actually, today. Oh, yeah, funding. That that was more the idea of this episode. We can talk social media all day long, but let's leave. Let's table that. Yeah. So I come from big, giant CPG world, right? That's my background. I've always worked for multi-billion dollar companies with budgets that we hope to someday just hit in revenue, right? I wanted to pick your brains on... You're you're the the founder of this you're the backing you're the 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 source of all the the funding for this and so how does it work how do you fund a startup what are the options why did you choose the route you went and just help people understand that the landscape that's out there at least from your perspective yeah i mean i it's it's an interesting there's a million different ways to fund a business and it, the, i think the fact of the matter is depending on what what industry you're in what you're doing it's going to vary drastically I don't think there's one specific thing that works for everybody. So it, it depends, right? If you're in so, technology, if you got a tech idea, how you're going to get funding, how you're going to keep that thing is going to be completely different than how we do it. So I, I'm going to play dumb and like, yeah. I'm going to say, this is what I think we should do. And you're going to tell me if I'm a complete moron and what we should do differently uh-huh. or if that's a good. So let, let's approach this that we are a, I'm, I'm a, a startup of a food company. I want to start a food company like what Switchback is. Yep. I got an idea. I got a product. I'm ready to start selling it. I go to the bank, right? And get a, a loan. No. Why? I mean, you can right now. It's going to be incredibly expensive. Start with your own money. First is the cheapest money you have. What so you don't have money. You have no money. Yeah, I'm like the average American. I've got, you know, a month's worth of my expenses in my savings account and I've got maybe a 401k and a little bit of retirement, but no, I just got an idea. 
I, I mean, if Do, you just, if you just have an idea, just give me money. If you just have an idea, you're not going to go anywhere because you, know, you need more than an idea in order to get something off the ground. So banks aren't going to give you money until you have tangible assets to collateralize against the loan, right? What the so, hell does all that mean? So you, 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 if you go to a, okay, so if I go to a bank right now, I might be able to get a small business loan, but they're going to, they're going to, the only thing left I have to collateralize is my house and my cars. So I need collateral for the loan. So if I default on the loan, what do they take? They're taking my house or my cars um, or, you know, my 401k, whatever. So you need, you need something as a form of collateral or in the business sense, in like our sense, you know, it could be our, our, you know, 14 pallets of smoothies. You got a couple hundred thousand dollars in collateral right there, right? So they can sell that. If we default, they can take that, liquidate that and try and recoup the cost. This is very broadly speaking because I'm not a <laughs> banker. So yeah, I mean, you could go in, but banks don't give loans based off of ideas. They give loans based off of cash flow, typically speaking. Um, and one way to get a loan quicker than others is in the, if you're SBA, if you have physical real estate attached to it, you can get a loan a lot quicker than you can if it's just a production company. If that's for an SBA, are we talking when, when I think go to the bank to get money, is it SBA, a small business loan? Is that typically what what you're going to try to get or will a bank actually give you a loan? No, I mean, depending on your revenue, you know, there's no way in hell you're getting a loan from a bank at, 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 a, at a small stage without positive cash flow. Without positive cash flow, I don't know of many banks that will give you a loan. I'm sure there are some. I'm sure five years ago, three years ago is way easier than it is today. Okay. But I, yeah, you're going, you're SBA for 99%. I mean, look, look at all the entrepreneurs we've talked to. It's SBA, 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 because it's almost- Which means small business- Administration. And that is, you go to a bank, but they still go to another- it's through, yeah, it's through the government entities. So the government's holding the loan, from my understanding. We don't have an SBA loan. SBA loans are like, everybody's like, SBA loan. You can get them, but they're going to be more, exp they're, they're significantly more expensive than what you would if you were a cash flow positive business from a bank. So if I'm, if I'm a startup, I, I'm an entrepreneur, I got an idea, and I don't have many assets or, or money to put behind it. Don't even talk to a bank. I don't think you can go to a bank unless you're going to buy a building. Like if you're doing a car wash, you have physical, they might give you a loan at that point, SBA loan through the bank, but you need that phys you need the physical, you need the physical asset. So I've always been told that SBA loves loans where you have property attached to it. So commercial buildings, real estate, that type of stuff. SBA likes it a lot more because they have something they can take in return. Okay. When it goes to shit. Okay. So for 95% of America that doesn't have something to collateralize or at least entrepreneur startup land, like where do you go then? What What is the next place to look? Is it? It's, it's going to be friends and family. My advice first and foremost would be prove your concept in whatever, whatever way, shape or form with whatever money you have. If it takes you three months, six months, nine months, prove the concept without taking out a loan make sure the concept works um, and, and and grow slowly, right? So we hear stories about, you know, I think it was like Laura Bar. She started that in her kitchen and she grew that thing. And by the time that she actually like moved to a co-packer, she had real cash flow coming in. You can do that for certain line, certain things. You can't do it. For, if you want to go out there and you want to go zero to hero, it's going to be tougher. But if you want slow growth and like it's a side hustle turn full-time hustle, my advice is don't take money, do it on the side, do it with whatever excess money you have. Buy enough ingredients, sell it. Buy enough ingredients, sell it. If you're looking for actual funding, then your options are fairly limited. You're going to turn to your friends and family, and you're going to turn to you know a, like a venture capital. But I mean, venture capital um, slash angel investing is really de demonic investing. I mean, these guys come in and take a absolute shitload of your company, and the horror stories are out there. So when someone says they're an angel investor, they've really got these little horns coming out of their head and they're like, they're just foaming at the mouth to try and take your company from you someday. It's a generalized statement, but I think, yes, there's a lot of people that need it. In our case, Matt, we turn to family and friends for private debt. So we've got loans through private individuals that we, uh, that I owe, I owe the money to, which is it's cheaper than a bank. I still pay significant interest rate, but it's cheaper than a bank because a bank won't give me a loan. Second thing is it is you could go get private investment. You could sell equity, right? So that's where at our stage would be, you know, angel investing is what they'd call it. But that, and that's cheap money, right? Because you're 
you don't service the debt on that. That's an investment. And if all oil goes to hell, you walk away. Sorry, bud, I lost your money. But they get equity. They get equity and they get a lot of equity the earlier in the company it is. Okay. So we we have one, you know, we we worked with one small family office that loved our product. They invested. We worked with one, then we got one What's a family office? A family office is just a family that has money that invests in stuff. So family offices range in size from billions and billions on down to millions. Um, and so for me, it's it. we haven't taken a lot of outside investment. We did. Um, but so far, and then after that, we've stayed with all all debt for the most part because... So you pretend that, well, I am dumb, but like the average person has no idea what you're talking about right now. Like I didn't even hear about a family office until like two years ago. Yeah. So, so walk me through like, okay, uh, friends and family, debt, like what? Well, how does that work? How do you find people that you you, put- a, you you ask your friends and you throw out terms and conditions that might be suitable to them, right? So, like we have entrepreneurs we met with where they go out and they're they ask me like, hey, if I get a two hundred fifty thousand dollar loan and pay this guy twelve percent interest, will that be attractive? I don't know. You don't ask me. Ask the guy that's going to write you the check or gal that's going to write you the check. What do you mean? So, so in terms of private debt, yeah. I, what, what sounds attractive to me isn't necessarily attractive to you. So it all depends on the person. If you're doing private debt, it's a private party transaction. Like don't ask your friends what is a good number to pay interest on private debt. Ask the person that's giving you that number. Does that make sense? Well, I suppose you you, you don't have a ton of options, right? You like, don't have a ton of, if the guy, if the guy says, I'll give you 250 and I want 18% interest and you go, well, I could go to the bank and I could take out a private loan and it's going to be 27, then it's a pretty fucking good deal, right? Yeah. So you, you're, you're beholden to what they're going to offer. Some people are going to offer more attractive terms. Some people are going to offer less, but on the private debt standpoint, I mean, as long as it's a legit transaction is documented, they have to be over with the federal uh, federal funds rate or whatever it is. So you can't go below the, the IRS minimum, but as long as you're at that or above that, it's a, it's a legit transaction. And so you can go ask your friends. So you could go ask if you got a friend that's got, you know, half a million dollars in the bank, you need a hundred thousand bucks. So, hey, give me a hundred thousand. I'm going to pay X amount of interest. It's riskier for them, but it also for you, it's, it's a better way of doing it than just selling equity in your business because selling equity, you're losing it. And then as you take on more investors, those guys get diluted as well. So let's stick with the friends and family route for a minute. Again, I, we've got an idea. I like your idea. Prove the concept. Prove that you actually know what you're doing. Because if you go ask for money and you haven't sold anything yet, well, at least a smart person should be like, why the hell would I give you money? You haven't shown that you can do anything. You'd be surprised. I mean, I think there's a lot of people that they, they want the story. They believe in the story. They believe in what you have to offer. Well, and so okay. I think, I mean, like, look at the entire tech world. I mean, what, probably 95% of tech companies out there never break even. I mean, they're not, they're not going to become cash flow positive, but they have these insane valuations day one because it's an idea. So it, it depends on what you're going after, right? I mean, it's, it's really, it really depends on the industry. So in this case, you said if you're a food company, it's going to be tougher to get the capital, I think. I mean, it's 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 a risky proposition. It's difficult. Whereas if you if you got this tech idea and you know you got some new algorithm, whatever, you can probably raise tens of millions of dollars in a fraction of time from friends and family. The, in that in that world, it would not be from. I mean, you could if you had the connections, and it all depends on the connections. I mean, if if you grew up in lower income, lower middle class. It might be tougher, but I would tell you like the first thing I do is ask your friends like, hey, I've got this idea. Do you know anybody that'd be interested? It's going to take you. It's you're selling. You are selling people on investing in your company. It could take you hundreds, if not thousands of conversations to find that capital. You'll find it. You'll find someone that eventually believes in you and, and wants to invest in if it's a good idea. And it might take you 10, but it's 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 not as easy as walking into a bank or putting up a sign saying, hey, I'm looking for investment. You got to work your ass off for that. And the goal should be to get debt. A loan with interest. I, I like I like the debt. I mean, debt's extremely expensive. You're servicing the debt. It's extremely expensive. Meaning you're paying the interest every month. Bingo versus the equity. So like equity is cheaper, but you're giving up a portion of your business. If you can go out there and you can say, I need 250 to start this company to buy all my raw materials. I need 250 for marketing. So I need 500 in total. And I guarantee that's all I need. Uh, and you can go sell five hundred thousand dollars worth of equity, so you can go that, and maybe you offer them ten percent. I don't know, twenty percent. That might be a better deal than going out there and getting de- getting debt. Right? It all depends on the specific situation that you're in and what you're looking to accomplish. Do you think um, if 
if you have visions of the of the business, maybe it only caps out at a couple million a year, and you're happy, and that's that's all you want. Do, does that sway you one way or another to look at debt versus equity? Or is that irrelevant? I mean, I, I don't think if you, if you're starting a company, depending on the industry, and you get to three million bucks a year, I, we, they call that a lifestyle business. I mean, as long as it's cash flow positive and you're making money, you're not going to get equity, right? Like if we went out to the market, if we were at six million dollars and we were making a million dollars of EBITDA. And we were just doing great, uh, but we didn't want to grow. Nobody's probably going to want to invest in us, right? Nobody's going to probably come. We're like it's not that exciting of a story. But if we go out there, if we're at six million and we're looking to get to twenty, and we have a pathway, yeah, then then you're going to take on equity because you, you not you, debt. I, I mean, depends on the situation. I mean, depends on what you can get in terms of if you need if you need four million dollars to get there, you're probably not going to get a four million dollar note. You're not going to be able to afford the interest on it, so you're going to have to. So it, it, you you weigh at what point you can do it, right? I've got a couple friends that have built fairly successful businesses off of all family and friends investing, small percentages. You know, guys write guys and girls writing twenty five fifty thousand dollars checks for one two three percent of the company. It's a great way to do it. It all depends on how much money. So like there's no right or wrong answer, right? It's just I will tell anybody if you're small, unless you absolutely have to, the 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 venture capital angel investing, it takes away a lot of your business and they're very demanding. I mean, you know, we we met with David and David always talks about things, talks about the cost of, you know, people are like, oh, I'll give you what was you raising 250,000 people want, you know, 30, 40% of the company's like, it's not worth it. But at some point you got to wait. Like if I, if that's 300,000, if it's 250,000 for 30% of the company, and it's the only way we can stay afloat. And the only way I can do this, that's probably worth it. You mentioned family offices earlier. How do you get into that world? Uh, network, ask around, um, go to the library and use the softwares that they have to look up family offices and investment decks or investment software. So like every library, at least like in Minnesota, Hennepin County, and then the University of Minnesota, we can go down there. We could go down there. If we were looking to raise 10 million, we want to raise from family offices and we had no connections. We can go down there. We can use the investment software, the investment stuff through the library that they have. And we can search for family offices. We can figure out like you can slice and dice it all these different ways. So if you're looking to raise money and you're trying to get connections and you don't have connections, Go to your local university, public university. They have software as a taxpayer. You get to use it. It's it's incredible. I mean, this software, like like when I was in insurance, this software is 35, 40 grand a year. And as long as you go down to the University of Minnesota, you can use this stuff as much as you want for really? free. Yeah. All they have all of these software. Like it's amazing how much software they buy. How as do a you public university. find family family offices? Are they registered? Do you have to be uh most of them are because they're making they're making investments or they've taken investment. Um, so it was a pitch, pitch deck, pitch something. What I would say is like, I'd go, I'd go ask around. If you're building a business and you have a network, go ask your network. So my first phone call would be to like three or four people in my network say, Hey, I'm looking for a family office to make an investment. I want a family office. Here's why. And they'd make introductions, right? The second thing is if you actually have size and scope and you're like, you're, you're, you're really humming along and you want private equity investment. That's a whole nother play. The thing about family offices, why I like family offices, they're generally long term. So they're going to invest. They're going to sit on that for a long time. Private equity is a three to five year turn, right? If they don't double, triple, quadruple their money in three to five years, someone's getting fired. And so I always tell people like, look for, if you're looking for investment, if you can not saying every family office does turn a family office before you'll turn to private equity because private equity is going to, they want more than 50%. They want 51% stake. They want control and they want to, they, they, they want everything. If that's not what you're looking to do. Look for people that'll make investments that are, that are in it for the long term. Is private equity the same as angel private equity and angel are completely angel investing is typically speaking. It's people that just make a, uh, no. So angel investing is minority investing, typically speaking. So you're, you're investing, you know, it might be 50 grand for 20% of the company in an early stage company. Whereas private equity, they nine times out of 10 want control of the company. They want 50 plus percent, if not a hundred percent. And they want to call the shots, put their own people in, do everything, build it, sell it, make money. Angel yeah. investing is, is a lot early. Angel investing is early stage. Private equity doesn't invest in early stage companies unless it's like an Uber or Lyft. Uh, this whole world is, it just blows my mind because I, I don't know shit about any of this. I, I'm traditional. I've only used the banks for most of my stuff, but it's, or I've been with giant companies where they just have a line of credit mainly. Dude, it, it's, it, it, 
investment in this space, there's no right or wrong. People are going to listen to this and think I'm an idiot. I, I probably am. I'm not, this isn't where I spend my life. I, I'm building a business, not worrying about financing, but it, it, there, there, there's a million different ways. And I, I always tell you like when in doubt, go ask someone in your network. I don't care where you are in the U S you know, someone that knows how to raise money and go ask those people how to raise money and just be, you know, like there's desperation, which we've seen with people that are desperate to raise money. And my advice to them is like, don't make a stupid decision. Like money is really important to keep funding your business and you've got a great idea, but don't sell out to people that you don't want to work with. And so okay. at the end of the day, it's your baby and you know, protect it like that. Don't make a foolish decision in the short run because you're desperate and surround yourself with awesome people like a board of directors, board of advisors, friends, family, everybody knows someone that can help them. Last question. Yo. And then we're going to, we're going to jump up. off friends and family. I mean, we already said friends and family, but what I've always heard, never take money from family. Yep. Yay or nay? I mean, de depends on what you're trying to do. If in, in many cases, I don't see any harm in taking money from family. If they believe in the mission and they willingly do it, um, it can make messy things, right? But what's, what's totally fucked up about that, Matt, is the fact that I've seen guys worth hundreds of millions of dollars make a $50,000 investment and lose their absolute shit over it. My rule is if the people don't have the money to invest and you don't think they have the money to invest, if, like, so, okay, so if you came to me today and said, Ole, we write me a $50,000 check and I had to cash out my 401k to write you a $50,000 check, I'm probably going to freak out over that, right? And I'm going to call you every day, Matt, how you doing, Matt, how you doing? If it's a nominal amount to someone, if it doesn't mean anything to them or like at the end of the day, like they lost it, take the investment because they're probably going to be pretty chill and pretty laid back. But if it's a material amount to them and you hear about this all the time, oh, my friend wrote me a hundred thousand dollar check, calls me all the time. that hundred thousand is a big deal to that dude. He's got a net worth of 300,000. One third of his net worth is now in your company because he's your friend. That's not going to end well. If, if you don't make him a return, he doesn't get his money back. That relationship is done, right? So the best piece of advice I can give is make sure that when you're talking to the person, if it's not a big amount of money, if it's not, if it doesn't seem, whether it be a thousand, five thousand, make sure it correlates to what they actually have so that if you lose it, if it all goes, you know, if you're a statistic, 90% fail, you're not, you're not going to end up destroying that relationship. I think that's the missing piece is friends and family are great. If you're not putting them in a tough position, if, if the money goes away, because most businesses don't work. Exactly. It, I, they fail. That's the thing. Like have the upfront, honest conversation. Like, yeah, we all think this is going to work, but if it doesn't, am I going to really ruin your financial situation by you investing here? Exactly. Cool. All right, man. That's all we got today. We're, we're going to just wrap this one up because I got a jet. Yeah. Peace.